12 o'clock. And we're going to begin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February seminar. That's a part of our larger brown bag research series sponsored by the Division of Education. I am Dr. DeQueer. I work as the coordinator of the Brown Bag Research Series. I am so happy that we are presenting this spring series in commemoration of literary scholars in education, and particularly uh, those people who actually highlight the African American experience, the American experience um, in America's early history. So we're focusing on four key literary scholars. Our final seminar will be a uh, commemoration of Miss Toni Morrison and her famous work, The Bluest Eye. We are encouraging our students because this is a free book that can be downloaded in order to read just the first chapter in their classrooms or independently. But the last seminar, which will be in May, I'm sorry, will be in April, will focus on an open forum about the central themes in that text, which um, center around race, beauty, and identity. Um, for this series, however, this seminar, we are highlighting the work of Miss Alice Walker. And she wrote a famous book, several famous books, but this is a famous one and I think my favorite one. And this is called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. We have some team members who will come up and share some specific reading strategies for how you will teach these literary scholars in schools. And we want to encourage everyone, regardless if your background is early childhood education, middle grades education, or secondary education, to focus and incorporate reading on a daily basis with your students. And here are some strategies to able to, um, in order to show uh, how you can teach reading and how you can do it effectively so that they not only read it, but that they can comprehend it. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our team leader and she's gonna introduce the team as well as herself. Good afternoon, everyone. And as Dr. DeQueer said, you are now in the Brown Bag series here in the second presentation. And today we are going to discuss strategies for teaching literary scholars in K through 12. So the title of our reading today is In Search of Our Mother's Gardens and it was written by Alice Walker. The team members presenting to you today are me, Rachel Slappy, Jasmine Allen, Relisha Hill, Darylisha Ezell, and Brianna Pierce. To begin our presentation, I would like to discuss a few major highlights of our author, Alice Walker's life. So she was born in February of 1944 in Eatonton, Georgia. During much of her early life, she lived in a society that was oppressive, racist, sexist towards women, especially African-American women. Her father was a sharecropper. She attended segregated schools. And at the age of eight, her brother injured her eye and causing one eye to become partially blind. Now, because of that injury, she withdrew from several normal activities that children would do at her age. So because she withdrew, she got lonely and she turned to writing to ease her loneliness. Now, after she graduated from high school, she received several scholarships and attended college, such as Spelman College, which is located in Atlanta, and Sarah Lawrence College, which is located in New York. During her college years, she got involved in the civil rights movement. And after she graduated from college, she taught at many colleges, as well as she continued her writing career through this time. Her first publication was entitled Once, and she published that in 1968. One of her most famous publications was titled The Color Purple. It was published in 1982, and it was later adapted into a movie. Now, for today's presentation, we are going to be discussing or presenting to you In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which was published in 1983. So an overview of this piece of literature well, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens was a collection of different essays, speeches, and letters that Alice Walker wrote throughout her life, or throughout her writing career. And she discusses the experiences of women, especially African American women, that when they lived in a racist and sexist society. 
the African American women devalued themselves because of that oppressive society. She discusses that many of their talents and their gifts were never realized or never reached their full potential because African American women and women in general were thought to be, were taught to be inferior. She discusses how African American women have kept their creativity and their spirituality alive throughout these years of pain and oppression. Now I'm going to hand it over to Brianna Pierce to discuss the first teaching strategy of today. Good afternoon, my name is Brianna Pierce and the reading strategy that I will be discussing is paired reading. Paired reading is a reading strategy in which the students read aloud to one another in pairs. When putting the students into pairs, more fluent readers can be paired with less fluent readers or students at the same level can read together. Paired reading can be used with a variety of books. The students will simply take turns reading by sentences, paragraph, pages, or chapters. This particular strategy enhances the students' ability to work together. It encourages positive interaction and cooperation, and it supports peer-assisted learning. First, the first reader should read first while the second reader follows along and listens, and then the second reader should pick up where the first reader stops. Then this will proceed to discussion. They will begin to ask each other, what was your page about or your, the reading excerpt that you read, what was it about or what was your favorite part? To demonstrate this particular strategy, I will read the first sentence and I will have one of my group mates to read the second sentence. And I remember people coming to my mother's yard to be giving cuttings from her flowers. I hear again the praise showered on her because whatever rocky soil she landed on, she turned into a garden. A garden so brilliant with colors, so original in its design, so magnificent with life and creativity, that to this day people drive by our house in Georgia, perfect strangers and imperfect strangers, and ask to stand or walk among my mother. Brianna, what did you get from this one? From the sentence that I read, um, well, at this point, I will describe or explain what I got from the sentence that I read. And from my sentence, I found that, well, I interpreted that um, this particular person who is reflecting, their mother had such a gift and a talent that whatever soil, whether it was damaged or unfertilized, it was, they had such a gift that they could turn it into a beautiful garden. Now, Jasmine, could you explain what you got from your sentence? Um, I interpreted that the garden itself is so beautiful, so enticing, that it brings strangers from everywhere together. To, to be able to admire and, and look at upon the hard work that the mother put into her garden. Okay, so as you can see, from pair reading, each reader had an opportunity to read, and they also had the opportunity to explain their interpretation of what it is that they read. And that concludes my demonstration of paired reading. Now I will turn it over to Jasmine Allen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Allen, and my strategy, my reading strategy is reciprocal teaching. Now, reciprocal teaching gives that opportunity for the student and the the teacher to interchange those roles of teaching. So you would do that by implementing these four steps. Predicting, questioning, clarifying, and summarizing. So predicting, basic, what, what do you think will happen? You can use the title of the text. You can use the author of the text. If, if you have a cover page, look at that. Look at the pictures upon the cover page to predict what exactly do you think will happen as you read. So the next step is questioning. What questions come to mind when you're reading the text? So one question could be, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this entire text? So ne the next step, the third step, is clarifying. So as you read, you'll find words and phrases that are hard to understand and that are unclear. So you want to clarify those as you read. Take context clues within the text to, to find out the meaning. So your last step would be summarizing. So as they're in groups, 
um, you would want the students to summarize verbally to their elbow partner and then maybe write down that summary as well and share with their partner and then they can share as a whole group or as a whole class and this allows them to further their comprehension of the text as well as be able to express their their interpretation so someone else may have a different interpretation as you do so now you can discuss and you can you know further that comprehension of the text and better understand what what you may understand the other person may not understand so you're helping each other figure out what the text is about another thing is you want to model this as a teacher first and then you want the students to practice and you want to float around and kind of monitor them making sure that they're following all the steps correctly so in order to demonstrate this I have an excerpt so naturally I would have a title of the text first and the author so I would take my first step predicting and I would take the the title of the text in search of our mother's gardens so I could take that as literal face so someone walking through their mother's garden just looking at the flowers describing each and every one of them maybe their memories that are attached to them uh, maybe they saw their mother planting those whatever they were doing with their mother as they were as she was planning and in planting and being in her garden so I can also take take the author of the text Alice Walker I know she wrote the color purple and what was the color purple about it's about African-American women in the early and early American history so maybe this text is also about African-American women along those same lines so now that I predicted I'll go on to read the text so when the poet John Tomer walked through the South in the early 20s, he discovered a curious thing. Black women whose spirituality was so intense, so deep, so unconscious, that they were themselves unaware of the richness they held. They stumbled blindly through their lives, creatures so abused and mutilated in body, so dimmed and confused by pain, that they considered themselves unworthy even of hope. And the selfless abstractions their bodies became to the men who used them, they became more than sexual objects, even more than mere women. They became saints. Instead of being perceived as whole persons, their bodies became shrines. What was thought to be in their minds became temples suitable for worship. These crazy saints stared out at the world wildly like lunatics or quietly like suicides. And the God that was in their gaze was as mute as a great stone. Who were these saints, these crazy, loony, pitiful women? Some of them, without a doubt, were our mothers and grandmothers. So throughout that text, I kind of picked out maybe a sentence that I didn't quite understand. Okay, so this is part of clarifying. In the selfless abstraction, their bodies became to the men who used them. They became more than sexual objects, even more than mere women. So maybe I was a little confused at that question. So I can clarify that. Selfless abstractions. So abstractions are things that are unclear. Uh, they're kind of not seen in the, in the naked eye. So in the selfless abstractions, their bodies became to the men who used them. They became more than, more than sexual objects. So these women were not seen as who they truly were, which were humans. They were women. They were human beings in the, of themselves. So next, I would summarize. So in summary, I think that this, this text to me is about black women who were so used and so idolized in a sexual way that they were not being seen as, their true, as who they were truly, which were creative and expressive and spiritual beings. And they had so much to give, but they were stomped by that oppressiveness and the, the, yeah, the oppressiveness that was put on them. And these women can be considered now, your, for some people, mothers, grandmothers. And considering the time of the text, which Alice Walker wrote this, and now, these could be even your great and great-great-grandmothers. This is a part of who you are. These women are a part of who you are. And so you have to look back in order to move forward and to identify your own self. So that concludes my presentation of reciprocal teaching. 
And now I will hand it over to Darylisha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darylisha Ezell, and my um, reading strategy is student goal setting. Student goal setting is a strategy that can help students differentiate their own methods for learning to promote their progress. This strategy is supported through identification of student misconceptions and error analysis. The purpose of student goal setting is for students to incorporate what they want to learn and establishing a certain level of understanding when engaging in the lesson. When using student goal setting, teachers should be flexible and general because when a goal is too narrowly focused, it may limit learning. So when you're in your classroom um, and your students are setting a goal, make sure that the goal isn't too broad um, and too open. This way um, they won't get distracted and won't be unfocused on um, their specific goal. Um, encourage student ownership. Um, so this is when like, you would just ensure why the students are setting a goal and what they want to understand from their goal. Focus on understanding over accomplishing tasks. So for example, um, when you're reading a text or when your students are reading a text and you um, give them a worksheet that coincides with their text, um, ensure that your students are reading for comprehension and understanding, not just solely to complete the worksheet. Um, allow students enough time to adapt goals to their own interests, learning styles, and prior knowledge. Um, going back to the previous example, when giving, a student, when giving students a text, um, make sure that you are demonstrating the way that they can use their goal with the text and their own personal interests and their different learning styles and allow the students to um, incorporate their prior knowledge and their specific goal with the text. Um, the example that I have, or the demonstration that I have for my excerpt, um, I would have the students look at the text, um, just like by the title or by the author, and have them establish a goal. So for this specific excerpt, the student goal is to find the relation between the excerpt and their personal experience. So when reading the excerpt, it says, therefore we must fearlessly pull out of ourselves and look at and identify with our lives the living creativity some of our great grandmothers were not allowed to know. I stress some of them because it, is, because it is well known that the majority of our great grandmothers knew, even without knowing it, the reality of their spirituality, even if they didn't recognize it beyond what happened in the singing at church, and they never had any intention of giving it up. So then, um, after reading the excerpt, the students would then create their own journal entry. So in this mock journal entry, um, it is explained or it is demonstrated by the student that um, the, in, the excerpt implies that modern Amer African American women must reflect on their history in order to understand the legacy left behind to honor their own potential and creativity. Um, I guess to elaborate on the excerpt, it is important for students to um, look back on the um, African American history and to um, understand the stepping stones and the pathways that the ones before them have left behind. This concludes my presentation on student goal setting. I will then turn the floor over to Rolisha. Good afternoon, I'm Rolisha Hill, and the strategy I chose to present today is Think, Pair, Share. Think, Pair, Share is a learning technique that increases personal communication necessary for students to process, organize, and retain their ideas. This strategy allows students to think through questions by using three steps. The first step is to think. During this, during this step, you give, time, you give students time to independently think about the questions that you may have been given in the beginning of class. The next step is to pair. Pairing, um, when you pair two students, this gives them time to discuss the questions and also allows each student to articulate their own ideas as well as compare and consider other ideas. And then you have your last final step, which is share. Sharing is when the pair group goes, goes within to the whole class and they all get together and share the ideas based on what they concluded with the three questions or how many, however many questions you presented in the beginning. Uh, to, de to demonstrate this, here are three questions uh, for 
our presentation or our excerpt, which is based on the title, what do you think the literary work is about? Another question could be, what is the theme? If you think there's more than one, let's talk about it. And the third question is, what do you gain from reading this literary work? And once you go through all this with your think, pair, and share, first you would think about the question as, a, as one student, and then you allow them to give time to go to a pair. So one of me and my peers would get together and we would think about the questions and discuss the questions and the answers we received from, you know, just throughout discussion. And then my pair would share to the class um, what we gained from the three questions in the text that we read. And you also want to note that uh, think, pair, and share is a reading comprehension strategy. So it's something that you do to comprehend the text um, or gain comprehension to the text that you've read and to kind of discuss and explain things that you did not understand. So this concludes my strategy, think, pair, and share, and I'll turn it back over to Rachel. All right, so do we have any questions or comments? With the, I'm early childhood. With like children's literature, like say a children's book? Okay, Relisha, would you like to take that one on? <laughs> of course. So um, I would say with Think, Pair, Share, let's say we're doing maybe second grade. Is that good? So with second grade, um, you would read, so say you had a book you wanted to read, or let's say Dr. Seuss, for example, you would read the book first as a whole cl as a class, as a teacher, you could read the book, or depending on your class, somebody else in the class could read the book, you can do popcorn reading, however you like to do it, but you would read the text first, and then you would give time, you would, you know, present three questions, or how many questions you want to give the students, and then you would give them time to think to themselves about those three questions and any ideas or thoughts they may come with. And then you go to the second step and they'll get with the elbow partner, whoever you have them partnered with, to kind of discuss those questions and to, you know, kind of feed off each other. And then the share part, which will be you guys come together as a whole group and each partner or each pair discusses the answers that they came up with to further answer those questions. And then that brings about a discussion amongst the whole class because most, most groups have different perspectives of the story or however it may be. Any other questions? You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I know you guys haven't read it beforehand, but from based on the excerpts that they gave, what do you think the story was about? Yeah. Um, I think it was more so centered around black women and how um, how they how they were living in like a racist racist community mm -hmm. and how they pushed through. throughout the hundreds of years of slavery, but particularly coming up into Jim Crow era is where you're looking at these women and you're looking at these women. And I love the um, statement that was made with John Toomer and talking about how they were as quiet as suicides or crazy as lunatics. Because what you see is maybe it looks like on its face a crazy woman walking down the street, but you don't understand that there are years and years of struggle and pain that is um, being revealed to you in a way. And it's just as a way of expressing it. It might be as quiet as, um, as a suicide or crazy as a lunatic. Um, so I thought that that was a good way. So we're talking about early American history, African American women. And let's add to that. What else are they, are they talking about? Well, it's, it's African American women and it's something else. What is, in Search for Our Mother's Gardens is a metaphor. Not necessarily searching for the ancestors, but what are they, what is she searching for? <coughs> Answers? <coughs> Answers? Not, not necessarily. Daughter DeQuer, I actually have something to say. Okay, good. What I interpreted from just the title and after reading the, egg, or the piece of literature, I thought that when it says in search of our mother's gardens, they're looking back at their mothers and their, the, 
African American women of the past, they were oppressed and all those great talents, like a lot of a lot of black women can sing, like they can sing. And so, um, you know, back then men would be like, You gotta be quiet. You can't you can't speak your voice, you can't, you know, show everybody what you got. So, you know, those talents, those gifts, they were hidden and people modern women today, African American women today they're looking back on that look. Let me go see. Let me see if I can find or search for those talents that were never revealed. Exactly. It's a metaphor for the talents. Yes. Um, as far as you were saying in the gardens, mm -hmm. gardens are made of many different types of flowers. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just happen like that. You have to plant those flowers. You have to feed those flowers. You have to water those flowers. <laughs> so all of these women were watered. They were, they were, fertilized in some way but they were still beautiful and they still make up this garden that also makes up your history there's a history along with every single flower that's planted yeah and so i think that's why she said in search of our mother's gardens what makes us us you know Absolutely. what makes you you what's planted inside of you from centuries and yeah. many generations many ago. generations yeah. um and then i'll just add one last point uh, we talk about different reading strategies that you can use. Um, and of course, for our early childhood folks, we know that you know, you're, you're teaching reading. This is the teaching of literacy. Uh, literacy. However, for our middle school uh, educators, for our secondary educators, for our college educators, um, we teach various academic disciplines, but students still have to read. Right? From kindergarten to third grade, you're learning how to read. But from third grade on, you're reading to learn. And one of the reasons why so many people struggle when they are in college is that they're struggling with understanding the reading and the text. It's dense, they can't understand it, they can't relate to it. So some of the strategies that we talk about here are strategies we use for teaching little ones, but they're strategies that you can use for reading your own course text, whether it be in science for Dr. Metlin or it be with me for history. But the key thing is, is that these strategies are universal. The second thing I would add is you have to provide, specifically when you're looking at historical texts and you're teaching social studies for all my social studies students who are in the room in my class and those that are coming to me in the future, you have to present the historical context. You can't separate. This is a beautiful piece of writing. If, if you haven't already read it, you can find it online. You can email me and I can send you the excerpt personally. It's a beautiful piece of writing. But you cannot separate the piece of writing from the history. They go together. So when you are presenting historical text to students and you're trying to teach them, uh, teach them about something that happened a long time ago, you do it through a reading, but you have to provide the historical context around it to be able to understand. So just reading it for its prose and for its literature and its vocabulary is great. But what these young ladies just showed is that there is a context that's a part of this history. And what she's trying to explain is through her prose, how do we better understand those talents that African-American women had through hundreds of years of being a part of the United States that were never fully realized. So we could have singers, we could have actors, we could have other playwrights, but what about our mathematicians? What about our inventors? There are a lot of talents that were there that we missed out on. And so this is a tribute to those women who were not able to fully realize the gifts that they had. And it's also a wake up and a warning to the modern women of today to say you did not, they didn't have that opportunity, but you do. Don't waste your talent. So she says that towards the end of it, and there is an excerpt that they talk here where she says, do not waste the talents that you have because so many people were not able to realize their own. Um, so it's a great piece of writing. We're glad that you guys came. Thank you to our presenters. So can we all stand up and we can give them a round of applause. And, 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 and as we end out, you guys can just say your names and tell us your program as we end out. So you guys can do that to the audience. Brianna Pearson, Childhood Education. Dear Alicia Ezell, Early Childhood Education. Early Shahir, Early Childhood Education. Jasmine Allen, Early Childhood Education. Rachel Slappy, Early Childhood Education. Now to be clear, all programs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys.